I've got a presentation to give, and um, as Graham says, my intention here is to um, put across some views of my own and to provoke thought and discussion rather than to give all the answers. You see, um, I've chosen a, uh, a title for the presentation. I've called it Waiting for Namibia's Great Leap Forward, and there indeed is a picture of Mao Zedong from the 1950s as he was leading China's Great Leap Forward. Um, I'm hoping that our Great Leap Forward, if it takes place, will, be, will have a lot of happier outcome than Mao's did, which of course led to the salvation of millions and the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. Um, I'm not going to uh, miss the opportunity to plug the book, Graham's already done it. Um, there it is in all its glory. Um, it struck me today as I was getting the presentation ready, you know, uh, for the last 30 years I've lived 20 of those years in Namibia, and the one thing that always really annoyed me was these big shot economists who would fly in, give presentations and then fly out again. Um, but here I am, 2022, doing exactly the same thing. Well, all I'd say in my defence is, you know, that is essentially my defence. Uh, I am not just a fly by night. I think I will probably stay engaged with the Namibian economy till I die. Um, and uh, I've loved every minute being engaged with it, and I've no doubt that will continue. Um, let me plug another product which Graham has already done. The Namibia Quarterly Economic Review, which I produce every quarter, have been doing that since the end of 2018. It's available free of charge, just subscribe on the IPPR website. I think it covers all the data, all the issues. Um, the last edition, for example, is called Meeting the Challenges of Oil and Gas, Forewarned is Forearmed. It raises lots of issues around gas, oil and gas exploration and, and production. Um, and I think it's well worth a read. It certainly um, brought a lot of new issues to my attention, and um, you know it's, it's not a difficult read. These features I write are sort of ten pages or so. They're not written for technical economists. They're written for everyone, the general public. And in fact, if there's one sort of um, a defining thread throughout my career in Namibia, and Graham's already alluded to the mention that I can't hold down a job for longer than three years here. Um, it is. Uh, the passion I had for opening up economic debates and data and information to the general public. Uh, that's one thing I've been doing uh, ever since I arrived here from uh, NetCrew um, through to my um, involvement in a whole range of organisations. So long may that continue, I think. Now, Graham's given me 45 minutes to speak, and I'm going to do my very best to stick to that. But there is an awful lot to say, and of course, because I find the Namibian economy so interesting, 700 pages worth of finding it interesting, um, I often have difficulties in just sticking to an allotted time. So feel free to start um, walking out or booing me if I go on far too long. But I do think what I have to say this evening will be of interest to all of you here in the room. Let me kick off then. So I want to briefly summarise where we've come from to reach where we are today in the Namibian economy. And I'll kick off by showing you um, some very explicit pictures. Now, I don't know if any of you are like my wife. If a film on Netflix has L, V, D, N, whatever the initials are, then she's the first one to be viewing it. Um, now, I'm not going to introduce any nudity tonight, don't be worried about that, or even violence, um, or discrimination, discriminatory content, as far as I'm aware, but I'm going to show you pictures that I certainly find pretty shocking, and I know we have some lovely young people in the room, and uh, those adults sitting around them might want to cover their eyes or ears when I show these pictures. So let me show the first one, viewer discretion is advised. Okay. <laughs> Now, here is a picture of Namibia's change in GDP, gross domestic product, a measure of the size of its economy. It's a standard measure used across the world. Yes, it has its faults, but it also has its uses. And I've gone right back here to 2008, before the global financial crisis, and I've just plotted growth, not using Robin's own figures. These are official NSA figures. And um, you can see some very interesting things. Um, 
basically fixed investment in the whole economy, and I've charted the numbers in constant prices, so this takes into account inflation since the year 2013. And um, I've split it down between private investment, uh, power state investment, SOE, state owned enterprise investment, or public enterprise investment, and government investment, so government investment. And I think you'll agree, even the young people in the audience can probably spot this one, there's been a trend, and that trend is very much a steady trend downwards, ever since really peaking in 2014. Of course, that's not good. Investment is important. It generates jobs and incomes in itself, but it also generates a more productive economy for future growth. And if your investment isn't being maintained or it isn't growing, then you're not going to grow in the future. So that is also a very um, important warning signal for us. The other thing to note in this chart, because people don't often know the numbers, is, is this thing here, the blue color. The blue color is private investment in the economy. Uh, private investment is the overwhelming amount of investment in the economy. Whatever government does, pretty much, government's rarely going to get up to the levels that the private sector collectively achieves year on year. But I think you'll agree that trend is pretty um, negative. Let me carry on. We've also not been creating jobs. Now, how do I know this? I know this because the NSA tell me, um, but they haven't told me since 2018 because we don't measure this on a regular basis. So I've shown you here a pie chart breaking down the movie's entire population of 2.4 million people in 2018 based on statistics from the NSA. And you can see here because obviously it is a young population, a lot of people aren't in the workforce yet. That's this lot here. Economically inactive people, um, pensioners, students, homemakers and the like. People who consider themselves unemployed, they're formally looking for work and not finding it. Then we've got formally employed people in the private sector in this red slice. Um, and these are, by formal, I'm using the Namibia Labour Force definition. That's to say people with some sort of and social benefits associated with their jobs. And we've got people here formerly employed in the public sector, 130,000 according to the statistic. And then here, a big wedge of informally employed people. These are people who are just getting by, um, making ends meet as best they can, but not in any formal job. Now, um, I don't know about you, but it strikes me as quite uh, extreme that this red slice is as small as it is. These are the people working in the productive part of the economy, trying to grow the economy. You've basically got 176,000 people in the economy supporting a population of 2.4 million. That's quite something. And remember, this is before COVID hit. Um, COVID, according to official statistics, we lost at least another 12,000 jobs on top of that, 12,000 formal jobs. Primarily in the private sector, the public sector didn't see retrenchments because of COVID. Okay, no one's left yet. Young people are still sitting and, and bearing with us, are you? Good. Strong stomachs. <laughs> right, now this is a little more detail. It's also quite an interesting couple of pictures here. And I say, during the last few years, we've lost control of the public finances as we've been consistently downgraded by the international credit ratings, which we pay every year to rate us in terms of our ability to repay debt. And I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail here, because this chart is quite hard to understand. This chart at the top shows you um, public revenue, that's the green bar on the left, how much revenue government is getting in every year. And the blue bar is how much government is spending every year. And then the red is basically um, the the budget balance, so it can be in deficit or in surplus. You can see we went into the global financial crisis here in 2008-2009 in, in, in a fairly strong fiscal position. We were basically running a balanced budget or a small surplus, um, and therefore when we emerged from the financial crisis, we were in a good position to use fiscal policy, that's to say government spending, to give the economy a bit of a boost because the global economy is obviously extremely weak. And we kept on doing that, and we had some very significant budget deficits while we did that. But then we reach this period here,
simply declining. Growth was evaporating, but our expenditure remained pretty constant. And of course, come COVID, we needed to boost expenditure because government had to do all sorts of things that it wouldn't normally have to do. But what that meant is, over time, our total stock of public debt grew significantly, and that's displayed in the chart below here, where it says debt as a percentage of GDP. So this is the value of our public debt as a percentage of the size of our economy. And you can see, up to um, sort of 2014-15, levels of public debt were in fact incredibly low. You could argue they were far too low. We were underborrowed, even though we'd come out of the global financial crisis and tried to use our fiscal firepower to boost the economy. But the story then took a dramatic turn. The public debt climbed quite significantly, to the extent now where public debt to GDP is expected to reach the 70% mark, which is extremely high for an upper middle income economy. And it means that we no longer have that fiscal firepower if we're faced by a crisis. We can't borrow an awful lot more if we need to. Okay, let me carry on. So that sort of takes us to where we are now. So the key question is, why did growth suddenly disappear? Now you might have your own theories, um, so I'm going to present some ideas of my own. And I can't say I'm proving it beyond doubt, um, but I find it pretty convincing. So I'd say there are two sets of reasons. And the first is the one you generally hear about in the newspapers, the events outside our control. We're a small upper middle income economy and a big global world economy that's being battered around by all sorts of forces we have no control over. Yes, um, the uranium price price plummeted after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. That was in 2011, well before growth evaporated. There was no doubt if uranium had continued to steam ahead, we would have seen a lot more uranium activity over the past decade or more. <coughs> Mineral prices, yes, they go up and down. Um, they've been positive as well as negative in the past decade, so I don't really consider mineral prices to be the prime reason why growth disappeared. Um, you can choose one, uranium has been um, you know, bumping along on the bottom for quite a long time. You can choose another gold, which has been absolutely booming. Um, we have seen some mine closures, mothballing, that's obviously um, delivered a, a hit to the economy, linked to the mineral prices, of course. Um, we've had national drought emergencies. I think the formal emergencies took place in these years, but drought has been a sort of almost constant feature of our landscape over the past decade. And of course, that involves a, an economic hit, although I would say um, the agriculture sector in the economy is a relatively small part of the economy in terms of contribution to GDP, not perhaps in terms of people riding it. Um, yes, we've had slowdowns quite substantive slowdowns in neighbouring Angola and South Africa, especially from 2016. And that obviously affects us. We have a lot of Angolans, a lot of South Africans who come over here, do all sorts of business, buy homes, um, take their children to school, um, go to clinics and the like, and also contribute to the general spend, spending of the economy. So that's obviously a factor. And then, of course, uh, last and certainly not least, the COVID pandemic, which struck in March 2020. Um, we've had these regular um, meetings um, chaired often by the president um, to, to track progress on how we responded to COVID, the last of which took place finally last July, the 45th touch presentation. So there have certainly been events outside our control. But I would argue there are other events as well. Chickens. But I would say these are very special chickens. These are chickens that are coming home to roost. Uh, any of you who have, who have read my previous guide to the Namibian economy, or read a lot of what I've written over the past one, two decades, will have seen that I've been quite critical of a number of um, aspects of economic management. And uh, in my view, a lot of what we've seen since 2016 is precisely the causes of this mismanagement, poor management, coming home to roost, I'm afraid to say. Let me give you some examples of the sort of thing I'm talking about here. Um, the first group of these chickens is the question, is under the question, do we take economic policy uh, 
rather brief charge sheet. This isn't by any means a comprehensive charge sheet, but um, these are the sorts of things I'm talking about. So the green scheme, which was launched in 2007, is now ending up with agribiz debt being wound up. Um, uh, a failure, I would say. Um, the quota allocation system in the fishing industry, the degree of ministerial discretion, especially following the 2015 um, legislation, a massive fish fraud scandal in the fishing industry. The fishing industry is essentially a black box. Who the hell knows what's going on in it? I certainly don't. Um, we've had the mining sector being um, battered by all sorts of uh, wheezes, tax wheezes, especially by governments, since two, especially since 2011, um, an export levy being locked on, royalty taxes introduced, tax deductibility of royalty taxes introduced and then deintroduced, ad hoc additional conditions being sent to the industry in, in a sort of scrappy letter from the Ministry of Mines and Energy. These are long-term investors can't mess around with them like this because they take long-term decisions. Our, our environment needs to be much more steady. Um, here's another example, a phosphate mining license that was granted in 2011 to the Mendia Marine Phosphate. We're now in 2022. Do we see any phosphate mining going on? There might be good reasons. We don't, but I'm just saying that it's an awfully long time to keep an investor suspended in midair. We scrapped the export processing zone tax incentives, the manufacturing tax incentives, and the export incentives without replacing them with a better offer. Um, how does that make sense? Um, I fail to understand that. We've got a Persia Opal joint venture with, with NIDA now, established in 2018. Um, at last count, I think it produced something like 55 vehicles. It hasn't sold many. Again, um, not a success. Um, we introduced a telecoms policy in 1999, which was designed to promote competition in the telecom sector. We end up with a state-dominated telecom sector 20 years later. How is that possible? Um, we award a banking license to an SME bank that's clearly not suitable and uh, was, in my view, a complete scam. Um, and shortly after, we had to liquidate it. Um, we're still finding out the, uh, the consequences of that liquidation now. Um, we set up a, uh, a, an expensive Ministry of Public Enterprises in 2015, but what results have we seen? Have we seen any public enterprises really being reformed? No. We have seen Anonymia liquidated, that's true. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we've seen the Namib Namibia Investment Promotion Act passed by Parliament, no less, in 2016, but it hasn't been enforced because the basic act is essentially fundamentally flawed. I think that's widely recognised now. Um, we started our empowerment, our black economic empowerment, as it was called then, um, policy formulation back in 2003. That's almost two-thirds of the life of independent Namibia. Um, we transformed that into TESEF in 2008, and then TF in 2012, and then we um, issued a draft NIEV in 2016, funny enough, exactly when the growth evaporated. But we still don't have a policy. We don't have clarity. We introduced a PPP policy, a public-private partnership policy in 2017. We still don't have any public-private partnerships five years later. This is just a sample, and you can find more in my book, a sample of what I mean by we're not designing pro policy properly, and we're certainly not implementing policy effectively. Finally, I was cheered when we established the NIPDB, the Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board, in 2020. We established it in the Office of the President, um, with some uh, fairly dynamic leader and dynamic um, staff. That looked a step forward on the old Namibia Investment Centre housed in the Ministry of uh, Industrialisation and Trade. But two and a half years down the road, I'm slightly concerned that we haven't produced the vaunted one-stop shop that everyone talks about. It's becoming really just more of a one-more-stop shop, shop with no real power over policy. I thought the whole point of putting, in, putting it in the President's office was for the President to be able to say, yes, we need to clarify investment policy for foreign investors in this country. And just bang the table and get things done. That hasn't happened. Okay, here I go again. More nudity, sex, violence, and bad language. I'm going to show you some other 
done it here in terms of total private sector investment in the blue, but then in the red I stripped out mining investment because basically during this um, hump here we had two very significant investments, and that's a great success for me, but two very significant investments in the mining sector in the form of Usap uranium mine and Ochakoto gold mine. And these really were quite large mines, especially Usap, the largest single Chinese investment in the whole of Africa when it happened. Um, but you can see it rather distorted the picture. If you look at the blue, you think, oh yeah, we're doing quite well in terms of promoting private, um, private investment. But if you strip that out and you look at the red line, then you can see private investment in the economy has been on a long-term decline. And I go back to what I said before, without private investment, without creating the conditions to encourage private investment, we're on a high to nothing. Here's another chart. Close your eyes if you're of a sensitive disposition here. Foreign direct investment, these are IMF numbers here, not Namibian, uh, Namibia Statistics Agency numbers, but they tell um, a, a pretty convincing story. You can see here foreign direct investment, and this is, it doesn't take inflation into account, this is just in nominal US dollars. And you can see here's, I think, Scorpio mine in the early 2000s, then we had the, the minerals boom and lots of investment, and then we had the global financial crisis, and then we had USAP, Machikoto here, boosting it, but then we've come right down since there. And in fact, we've experienced net outflows of FDI in a couple of years. That is really, really worrying. Because while, of course, domestic investment is important, foreign direct investment is very important too. Let me carry on. So I've looked at policy, I've looked at investment, and now I'm coming on to public enterprises. As I said, we set up a, a very um, you know, uh, lavish, I think, uh, Ministry of Public Enterprises in 2015. But what has it achieved? Yes, Air Namibia wasn't, wasn't liquidated, but that wasn't part of the strategy in my view. Our hand was forced because the numbers involved were just so big, we just couldn't carry on throwing money at this enterprise. If you look at the other enterprises, and what I do, Brent didn't mention this, but I also do a public enterprise governance ranking for IPPR every year, and this is sort of based on that analysis, the latest analysis I did, is for 2021. Of those 22 or so public enterprises that the Ministry used to classify as commercial public enterprises, the ones in red are either loss-making or we haven't seen an annual report for so long that we assume they're loss-making. Um, and you can see the majority are red. Um, there are others like the Nubia Desert Diamonds, um, and, and even Telecom Namibia, which have questions around it. Rose Authority, I'll put the asterisks here because they're not actually mandated to make a profit, even though they generally do make a surplus, so I should make that clear. I'm not sure why they were classified as a commercial public enterprise. You can see this is the result of our reform program. It doesn't look like a reform program to me. And then public infrastructure, let me briefly go through this. So we spend a lot of billions every year on public infrastructure, mostly through the budget. We get loans from abroad and the African Development Bank and all sorts of other people to fund them. But I would say we do not properly assess these public infrastructure projects. We end up with the Northern Railway Line extension, the Nekatal Dam, a dam without any associated economic activity with it, the National Oil Storage Facility, the Harbour Port expansion, a new international airport which was thankfully abandoned, cut back, endless new government and public enterprise offices. I mean, I was shocked when I came back to winter uh, a few years ago to see all these new offices. Um, roads, yes, roads, <laughs> more roads. I drove on a few of them over the weekend. They're very nice, they are too. Much better than in the UK. But I'm not sure you can justify them with any sort of economic cost benefits analysis. And I don't think we subject these things to that sort of analysis. I've certainly never seen a, a, an economic uh, cost benefit analysis for these things. And by cost benefit analysis, I mean proper economic social cost benefit analysis, which captures all the different costs and benefits to society, not just a financial return. It's hard not to come away with the conclusion that the public um, procurement system is, is really just a feeding trough for contractors. We have unnecessary capital projects that are over-engineered with inflated price tags. I don't like to say that, but I don't know what other conclusion one could really draw. 
the previous slides. What growth and jobs have we got to show for all this? I ask you that. Precious little, I would suggest. So to summarise, I, I would say there are a number of policy characteristics which, uh, which are a, a great weaknesses in the way we do things here. The first is, well, there's always a knee-jerk propensity to blame economic problems on external factors. It's always world markets or the ground or something else, despite a lot of talk about accountability and responsibility. We don't seem to hold people accountable. Second, we really have an extreme reluctance to take difficult decisions. I think performing the, the loss-making public enterprises is a good example of that. Now, all governments have this. Of course, you're creating winners and losers. But it's quite an extreme uh, feature, I'd say, in India. You know, you set up this ministry and you reform nothing after seven years. I read, for my sins, I read old budget statements uh, because I get quite, quite a kick out of going back to 1995 or 1995 and just seeing what the ministers then were saying. They were saying pretty much exactly the same as they are now. Oh, the public sector is too big, the wage bill is too high, we haven't got resources for you know, social grants and other things. Um, we need to reform our public enterprises. Almost as soon as they were created, some of them were, were in need of reform. It's the same old thing. I could cut and paste the budget speech from the 1990s into one of last year, and it would still be relevant, I hate to say. In fact, a friend of mine, and I won't name who it was, sent, sent me a front cover in the Libyan not so long ago. And I read it and I thought, wow, this journalist has really captured what's going on and what needs to be done in the economy um, at the moment. And then he pointed me to the date on the front, and it was dated 1999. <laughs> I felt a little bit foolish. <coughs> This, I think, incredibly damaging. A real tendency to float half-baked policy ideas out there in public, which then hang over the investment landscape like a cloud of uncertainty. I think these are two good examples of that, but they're not the only example. Ah, the NIA and the NEPA. Um, we don't seem to realise that the government, because it has the power to enact policy, what the government says makes a difference. What government says, I mean, we're seeing that in the UK at the moment, uh, with the currency crisis there. Government has to be very, very careful what it puts out there because investors respond to it. They, involve, they respond to every piece of new information that we put out there. So we have to be very certain of our facts when we put something out. We have to have researched it, we have to analyse it, we have to have consulted on it, and then we put it out. We don't just put out half baked ideas which can then actively lead to concrete um, lack of, of investment. These have uh, concrete repercussions for us in the economy. Yes, an idea, yes consultation paper has concrete implications. And then finally, I would argue we have a, a lack of a long-term strategic focus on the one thing we need to be doing as a small economy in the world, and that is focusing on export diversification. Thankfully, this was recognised in the report of the Namibian High-Level Panel on the Namibian Economy. I was overjoyed to see that finally being recognised. Precious little has happened since. That is the one thing we need to get right if we can grow this economy and provide jobs and incomes for the mass of people. Okay, that's sort of where we've come from, where we are now. Uh, so where are we going? Well, we know certain things are happening or will happen in the coming years, and I'm going to list a few of them. This isn't comprehensive, but these are some of the big ones I see coming down the track. The first is obviously the war in Ukraine. We don't know how long that's going to last, the impact that has on world energy prices, gas for the Europeans, yes, but more generally for the global economy. And the, and the degree of deglobalization this might have awakened. We've lived in a period of 30 years since independence where globalization was essentially on the march. And there was a huge global market out there which we could tap into and take advantage of. I know we see it as a threat, but it's actually a huge advantage as well for a small country, it enables it to grow fast. That process might be put into reverse because the world is dividing into a number of different groups of countries with different values, different political systems. That might be bad for us in Namibia. We're seeing higher global interest rates, possible recession in high income countries, which obviously might have an impact on some of our imports, uh, exports, and zero COVID policy in China, which is, of course, stymieing the Chinese economy ability to grow at the moment. And I think, looking at the revenue picture that I displayed earlier, 
couple of years up to the next election, um, in terms of new new revenues uh, that will allow government to spend heavily. Um, that's not to say we'll necessarily be in big trouble. I think she will probably manage to stabilise the boat. Yes, there'll be a few more SACU revenues, a few more diamond revenues, and things, which will allow him to maintain things as they are, pretty much keep the ship afloat. But we're not going to see lots of new revenue coming into the fiscus, in my view, <coughs> until oil starts flowing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We're also going through a very interesting time at the moment. Yes, we postponed or cancelled the census, which is a real shame because the census does provide incredibly useful information to economic planners and managers. But we're going through the period now post independence where Namibia's population has almost doubled since independence, but it's becoming a majority urban population compared to a majority rural population. And that's a very important moment in any country's development. What do those urban people need? How do we create opportunities for them? We've got the elections coming up in 2024. I know we have politicians in the House. I'm not going to say too much about this, but the question that's on a lot of people's lips is, have we seen peak swap? Oh, now is something very different going to happen at the next election? Can swap hang on to majority power, or is it more a question of um, some sort of coalition or something like that? That will have, obviously, implications for economic management. I don't want to go too far into that. I'm not a politician, thank goodness. <laughs> We've got South African elections in 2024 too, and I think people in South Africa are also asking the same question. Are we seeing peak ANC? Um, you know, there are some quite um, shocking um, views of what is likely to happen in South Africa going forward from this moment. We've got power outages every day. Um, we've got provinces trying to go their own way. We've got economic freedom fighters um, making all sorts of noise. Um, it's a very uncertain situation and obviously being a much larger neighbour that we're linked to in terms of our monetary policy and our trade policy that will have consequences for us. We've got a very large Eurobond redemption coming up in 2025. We're going to have to find the US dollars to repay bondholders then and that is a large amount of money multiplied by I think the exchange rate at the moment is 18 or so. That's a, a, big, a big sum. We did redeem the last one by basically applying pressure on the GIPF to swap it. Um, can we do? Can we pull off the same trick in, in 2025? I'm not so sure we can. And then we've got ongoing climate change. Um, we might be reaching already 1.5 degrees by 2030, but that will steadily have a greater impact on our economy, especially on the agriculture sector, um, the fishing sector through the salination of, of seawater, the hydro, electricity we generate, uh, Kana, will have all sorts of implications that we're only now starting to think about. But it will also present opportunities for us as well. Um, the world is going through this energy transition, 2030 is an important year, 2050 is obviously much more important, but that does potentially represent opportunities for us in the uranium and renewable sector, across the other sectors too. So those, I think, are the key events I see coming down the track over, over the next few years. Don't worry, I'm not too far off now. Okay. Right. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay. Finally. Yes, so far I've been very critical uh, of government and economic management so far. But I think the, the wonderful thing about Namibia is that not everything goes wrong at once. And there are always good things happening at the same time as bad things. I want to finish my talk by saying a few things about green hydrogen and oil, things that you would have read about in the newspapers and possibly discussed with your friends, because these are potentially uh, game-changing uh, initiatives for Namibia. The first is green hydrogen and green ammonia. Well, there's a lot going on. Um, certainly, Namibia has the resources in terms of the sun, the wind, the coastline we have for producing the desalinated water as an input, uh, the land we have, although it's um, uh, a very special land that we, we're going to be using. But I cannot emphasize this enough. There are huge risks inherent in a completely new global industry on both the supply and the demand side. We don't really understand the pricing mechanism of this new industry. We're not sure about the potential profitability.
don't know because it's still in the process of being formed. Are we comfortable as Namibia with a strategic relationship with Germany and the EU? Because that seems to be what's happening at the moment. Maybe it's a good thing for the country, maybe it's not. Um, can we produce green hydrogen, green ammonia at competitive prices, i.e. one US dollar per, per kilogram, maybe two US dollars per kilogram? I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced about that yet. Um, or will the industry require long-term subsidies from the EU to function here? And that is a very different situation, of course, if you're relying on subsidies from another part of the world for an important industry. Will it be environmentally friendly? Um, the hyphen scheme certainly is going to take place in Schberger Beach, which is a, a national park, an um, ecologically sensitive area. How will that affect, affect the brand of the green hydrogen and ammonia we produce? Are people going to buy it if they think a, a, a very special part of the planet is being destroyed to create it? Okay, Hyphen are talking about green hydrogen, the first production by the end of 2026. I think that's definitely the best case scenario myself, given how things have slipped on other projects. For example, the phosphate mining I mentioned earlier. I think Hyphen are assuming basically that everything goes according to plan. And we've got these 30 million euro pilot projects, which I think are very interesting as well. Um, the, the port facility in Morpheus Bay, refueling station, hydrogen refueling station, which is um, very interesting, the dual fuel locomotives for Transnarmic, powering Transnarmic locos with um, hydrogen as well as uh, normal fuel, and we've got an agriculture scheme um, using green hydrogen, uh, green ammonia as an input. Very, very interesting. I mean, I would say, uh, yeah, sorry, and the hydrogen in France power station in Aronga, which I only recently discovered, uh, apparently that's going to be up and running by 2024. Um, certainly Namibia is one big green hydrogen laboratory. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I personally think it's very exciting, but there are risks associated with it. And I'm happy to report, you might have heard lots of different things, I know you've come across a lot of skeptics too, but the people I talk to, both in government and in the, the industry, are very positive about the way things are going forward. Namibia seems to be playing things very much by the book, bringing in top quality expertise to strengthen the Namibian side, setting up um, the skills in the new industry and generally doing all the right things as far as I can see. So my view is quite positive about green hydrogen and ammonia, but I suspect the timeline associated with it is a lot longer than where it comes from at the moment. Don't worry, I'm almost there. Oil and gas, so a few words about that. Um, this is a quote from Tom Alwendo not so long ago making it very clear that Namibia will not suffocate itself by cutting off potential oil and gas resources that will assist in solving our problems. In other words, if we discover oil and gas, we're going to go ahead and exploit it, despite, of course, um, opposition from certain quarters globally. Um, the very good IEA, International Energy Agency, is a report of May 2021, which produced a very detailed roadmap of how the world gets to net zero by 2050, stating very clearly, from today, this is 2021, no investment in new fossil fuel supply projects, no further final investment decisions for new unabated coal plants, that's to say doing something about the carbon dioxide that coal plants emit. By 2035, there are no sales of new internal combustion engine passenger cars. By 2040, the global electricity sector reached <laughs> net zero emissions. This is one of their scenarios going forward in order to reach net zero by 2050. Okay, clearly, you know, for a country like Namibia, there are no significant prizes for not going ahead and exploiting oil and gas. We've had significant fines at the beginning of the year by Shell with Qatar and Namcor and Total Energies. Again with Qatar, and we've had oil as well as Namcor. Um, a lot more drilling is required, but I think it's already becoming clear these are potentially huge fines. Um, among the top 20 global discoveries of the last decade, possibly even larger. Of course, the companies themselves are reluctant to say too much. They need to do a lot more drilling. But if you if you listen to the chat and read the commentary on it, I think this is potentially very, very big. And remember, Namibia has a population of 2.4 million people. Technically challenging, yes, because this is in very deep water offshore, um, where the weather is also pretty rough. But I think these companies, if any, can overcome those challenges. The question is when. Um, government wants production within 
Oil companies want longer, they're not giving dates. Wood McKenzie, a very well known uh, consulting firm in the industry, is talking about 2027 possibly. That's still quite a way down the road. It's not going to save us over the next couple of years from a fiscal point of view. At peak, um, the talk is could add up to 5.6 billion uh, US dollars a year to state revenues. This is probably into the 30s, into the 2030s. That's an awful lot of money. I mean, that's essentially doubling the size of our government revenues uh, as they are now. So that is a lot of money. But the door is closing um, because of global warming and the reduction in the use of fossil fuels. The door to new oil and gas projects is closing. And any haggling over onshore refineries and local content and all these things that I'm sure will be haggled over will cost time and delay the project. And of course, even if you hit oil and you start producing oil, the challenges don't stop there. You can't just sit back and let it flow and let the money roll in. Um, and if you read that uh, quarterly economic review that I mentioned right at the beginning, you'll see there are plenty of problems associated with the success of the successful oil and gas industry. I won't go over that now. So, I'm coming to the end. Um, nothing I've written and discovered in my book has deviated me from this conclusion, which I came to Namibia with back in 1991 as a young green economy. It is good policy and effective implementation, not natural resource endowments and luck that determine economic performance. And we are not just passive victims of circumstance. It's in our power to do something about all this. And I love this quote from um, <coughs> Aristotle Onassis. We must free ourselves of the hope that the sea will ever rest. We must learn to sail in high winds. The global economy is the sea. It's going to be rough. We're going to be battered by all sorts of storms, from mineral prices to COVID pandemics. But we need to pursue policy that copes with that and that is able to change and adapt and take advantage of change out there. So, I think we are at a bit of a crossroads over the next couple of years. Of course, it's more of a spectrum than a pure left-right, um, you know, which way should I go decision. So the first is, you know, we can carry on with a sort of politicised, untechnocratic, rather corrupt and ad hoc economic management of the economy, which I would argue, and I have argued today, is roughly what's been happening in Namibia for a long time. Or, we can go for a much more technocratic, transparent, rules-based, strategic management of the economy, um, aiming towards export diversion over the longer term. That involves making some very difficult decisions and striking some very difficult trade-offs. So, taking that into account, I think there's sort of two extreme paths you can go by, and I'm sure we'll end up somewhere in between. The left Zeppelin fans among you. There's the low road where the next president, post 2024-25, turns a blind eye to corruption and an enriched elite continues to ignore the, the needs of the poor. There's a delayed start to oil and green hydrogen projects because of all sorts of haggling and laws and regulations that aren't quite in place, leading to an extended period where government has very, very limited revenues to spend. Government borrows heavily as soon as it's able to do so. As soon as we know the oil is there, government borrows heavily in advance of all revenues but spends it on unproductive ends. And all revenues themselves exacerbate corruption. Uh, it becomes a huge um, pot of money that politicians dip into for all sorts of um, ends that aren't in the national interest. Plenty of, plenty of countries have experienced this. And government essentially gives up on the idea of diversifying the economy and creating jobs in the wider economy because it has this very significant income source and it just splashes the cash, makes sure a bit of it um, moves around, is dished out to the population. But essentially, you've got a, a sort of an island oil and gas industry which produces money for the exchequer, for the fiscus, which then distributes it with cash and puts the rest in the, in the sovereign wealth fund. So that's the low road, I would argue. And we end up suffering from what economists call the resource curse or Dutch disease, where the rest of the economy withers and dies because of the strong oil and gas economy. Or we decide, no, we want to take the high road. And that consists of pretty much the polar opposite. The new president clamps down on corruption, adopts a much more technocratic approach to 
used to design policies. Heavens. <laughs> Oil and green hydrogen projects start to take shape in the coming years, allowing government to borrow and bridge the fiscal gap. Suddenly, public money becomes more plentiful because the projects are on track. Oil and gas revenues are effectively managed, and the benefits are distributed across the population, leading to poverty reduction and resources, additional resources for climate adaptation which we have to devote because we know the climate is changing. And the government ensures Dutch disease is avoided when it uses oil and green hydrogen as a means of diversifying the economy. That's not a, an easy trick to pull off. It involves some very clever policies and very good implementation with which to achieve that. But that I would argue is not my work. Yes, I'm there, Graham. <laughs> I don't know how long that was. It didn't seem, it didn't seem 45 minutes to me. Right. Read my book, see if you come to the same conclusions as me about the last three decades. 